In March 1296, King Edward the Perth of England embarked on a formidable military campaign, his sights set on subduing Scotland and punishing King John Balliol for his defiance. The English forces swiftly descended upon the town of Berwick-upon-Tweed, leaving devastation in their wake. Edward, known for his determination and strategic prowess, recognized that the complete conquest of Scotland was within his grasp. Following the sack of Berwick, Edward turned his attention to fortifying the town's defenses, a testament to his meticulous planning. Aware of the significance of securing strongholds along the Scottish coast, he sought to establish a firm foothold in the region. With each passing day, Edward's resolve grew stronger, fueled by a desire to assert his authority and quell any resistance. It was during this critical phase of the campaign that King John Balliol, a puppet ruler in Edward's eyes, sent a message renouncing his homage to the English king. Edward, known for his stern and uncompromising nature, viewed this act as a grave folly. He remarked with disdain, O oh, foolish knave, what folly he commits. If he will not come to us, we will go to him. This declaration underscored Edward's unwavering determination to bring John Balliol to his knees. Eager to press his advantage, Edward identified the next target in his path, the formidable castle of Dunbar, held by the Earl of March. Although the Earl of March was aligned with the English cause, his wife Marjorie Comyn harbored different loyalties. In a surprising turn of events, she allowed fellow Scots to take refuge within the castle walls, defying her husband's political alliances. To deal with this challenge, Edward dispatched one of his most trusted and experienced lieutenants, John de Warren, the sixth Earl of Surrey, to besiege Dunbar. This decision was not made lightly, as Warren's marriage to John Balliol's daughter added a personal and political dimension to the mission. Accompanied by a formidable force of knights and soldiers, Warren marched northward, ready to invest the stronghold and crush any resistance. The news of the impending English attack reached the defenders of Dunbar, who realized the gravity of their situation. Desperate for assistance, they sent urgent messages to King John, who had stationed the main body of his army at the nearby town of Haddington. The Scots looked to their king, hoping he would display the leadership and courage needed to lead them in a daring rescue mission to relieve the besieged castle. However, King John's actions proved disappointing yet again. Failing to exhibit the qualities of a capable commander, he chose not to accompany his army to Dunbar and decided to send a force to repel Surrey's army under the command of John Comyn, and thus the responsibility of defending Scotland and challenging the English forces fell upon the army itself, without the guidance and presence of their king. This decision cast a shadow of doubt and uncertainty over the Scottish forces, who now faced a daunting task without their monarch by their side. As the Scottish army advanced towards Dunbar, the campaign of 1296 entered its final and most critical phase. The fate of the castle and the outcome of the larger conflict hung in the balance. Both sides understood the significance of this encounter, which had the potential to tip the scales of power in the region and determine the course of history. The stage was now set for a momentous clash of arms where courage, strategy and leadership would be put to the ultimate test. The rugged Scottish terrain would bear witness to a monumental battle that would echo through the annals of history, leaving an indelible mark on the collective memory of both nations involved. The clash between England and Scotland at Dunbar would reveal the true metal of the warriors and shape the destiny of their lands for years to come. On the morning of the 27th of April, the forces of Earl of Surrey, John de Warren, and the Scottish army led by John Comyn assembled for a decisive clash at the Battle of Dunbar. This is not a good place for a the Scots had taken a strategic defensive position on the high ground of Spottismuir near Doon Hill, overlooking the English forces. Surprisingly, Earl of Surrey seemed unconcerned with the Scots' advantageous position and split his forces, leaving his infantry to maintain the siege of Dunbar Castle, while he launched an attack on Comyn Scots on the hill with his own cavalry. It was a bold move, considering the steepness of the terrain and the potential advantage it gave the defending Scots. As the English forces approached the Scottish position, Comyn observed their crossing of the spot burn, which broke up their lines and obscured their true numbers due to the steep gradient. 
Mistaking this for a retreat, Komin charged downhill with his men, anticipating an easy victory. However, the charge quickly devolved into a disorganized and piecemeal attack, lacking the cohesion and effectiveness needed to break through the English lines. On the other side, the Scots also suffered from their own hesitance, not fully realizing the steepness of the gully below them until they were almost upon it. This hesitation blunted their charge, and when the English, having quickly regained their composure after fording the spot burn, countercharged, the Scots were caught off guard and their formation crumbled. Although the casualties were relatively minimal, the Scots were rooted. Sir Patrick Graham, a Scottish knight, was among the few who lost their lives. Many others were captured, including the Earls of Athol, Menteith, and Ross, as well as their commander John Comyn. Approximately 100 knights were taken by Surrey, while some managed to escape to the safety of Ettrick Forest. The victory at Dunbar was further solidified when King Edward the Poet himself arrived with the main English army the following day. The remaining Scottish resistance quickly crumbled as Dunbar Castle and other key strongholds, such as Stirling and Roxburgh, surrendered without resistance. Even Edinburgh fell after just a few days, completing the total defeat of Scotland. For Earl of Surrey, the victory at Dunbar was undoubtedly sweet. Not only did he secure a key castle for his king, but he also captured over 100 high-status Scots. Dunbar appeared to be the seal on King Edward's conquest of Scotland, with control swiftly extending over the south and central regions. Edward celebrated his triumph in Perth, receiving word of King John Balliol's submission. In a humiliating display, John Balliol was stripped of his authority as king, symbolized by the tearing of the royal blazon from his tabard. He was then taken to the tower, while Edward continued his victory parade. The English king further asserted his dominance by removing the sacred stone of destiny from Scone Abbey and transferring it south, along with the royal regalia held in Edinburgh. The message was clear. Edward had not only dethroned Balliol, but had also subjugated Scotland to his own rule. To solidify his control, Edward held a parliament within the conquered city of Berwick, where all Scottish landowners were required to swear fealty not to a king of Scots, but to him, the King of England. After occupying Berwick for several weeks, Edward entrusted the governance of his new province to his champion at Dunbar, whom he appointed as Viceroy. By September of 1296, Edward Longshanks felt confident in his firm grip over his latest conquest. However, unbeknownst to him, the embers of rebellion were already smoldering in the heart of a young patriot named William Wallace foreshadowing the challenges that lay ahead for Edward's rule in Scotland. On this channel, we are putting together narrative historical cinematic battles. Make sure to subscribe and thank you for watching. See you on the next one.